This episode of Real Engineering is brought to you by Brilliant, a problem-solving website that teaches you to think like an engineer. Last year, there were over 4 billion passengers in airlines around the world, a figure that grew from about 2.5 billion just 10 years earlier. The airline industry is big business with a total revenue of $834 billion expected in 2018. With this kind of money for the taking, governments and private companies want to get their share by designing an airport that can facilitate and encourage air traffic to pass through it. But if we take a look at the footprints of some of the busiest airports in the world, there are some patterns, but nothing immediately jumps as a go-to design for air traffic. So let's demystify some of this mysterious world of aviation and figure out how to optimally design an airport. In the early days of aviation, runways were often nothing more than a cleared field. The Wright brothers chose Kitty Hawk, an isolated strip of beach, because it had plenty of space and more importantly, strong winds to help their plane get off the ground. Today, that practice isn't all that different. Airports are some of the largest plots of lands allocated for a single use in any city, and wind will still dictate their design. Once again, taking a look at runways around the world, you may not see a pattern at first, but if you overlay the prevailing winds in their area, the pattern becomes clear. Most airports in the Northern Hemisphere are aligned east to west, which coincides with the most consistent wind directions. Inspect any airport and it's likely that they have followed this design principle. This is done to take advantage of the wind, just as the Wright brothers did all that time ago, because a head-on wind adds extra lift, reducing the power required for takeoff and reduces landing speed. It also maximizes the operational hours of the airport in windy conditions. The alternative is landing with heavy crosswinds, which is not particularly fun for the passengers or easy for the pilot, if the pilot can land at all. The crosswinds a plane can tolerate differ with plane design, with planes with larger vertical surfaces like winglets and vertical stabilizers being more susceptible to crosswinds pushing them off course. A typical plane like a Boeing 737, the most common airliner on the planet, can tolerate a crosswind of about 60 km per hour with a dry runway, and 55 on wet. Anything exceeding that and the planes need to hold until the winds calm down or divert to an alternative airport. Tailwinds are even less tolerable with winds from 18 to 25 km per hour making it too dangerous to land at any but the longest runways. Some airports like London City Airport have to enforce their own crosswind tolerances below the plane's tolerances as their runways are narrower than average. Fortunately, tailwinds are easy to counteract by landing in the opposite direction. NATS, formerly known as the National Air Traffic Services, illustrated how these shifting winds affect air traffic with UK air traffic data from February 14th, 2014. On that day, winds of up to 110 km per hour were recorded, making it impossible for planes to land all over the UK, causing towering holding stacks to open over London airspace, with the lower planes waiting for a break in the wind to land. Yellow flight paths here are delayed planes, which were approaching two hours, Red flight paths are diverted planes. This is an extreme case, but this incident cost these airports and airlines massive amounts of money. Designers of airports will analyze decades of wind data to minimize any possible operational shutdowns like this. This is their first design principle to maximize traffic, to simply minimize shutdowns due to wind. Now that we've chosen our runway direction, let's pick a location in our city to place our airport. With this wind alignment in mind, let's say east to west for this example, most city airports will attempt to place the airport on the northern or southern edge of the city, so low-flying aircraft coming in to land don't have to fly over the city. This is the case for most airports. But Heathrow Airport is a special little butterfly located smack in the middle of London. This is fantastic for accessibility, with London city centre only a short train ride away, but it creates problems of its own. The first is noise. In the 1950s, the owners of Heathrow signed an agreement with the residents of Cranford to not allow planes to take off to the east, which is often needed as the wind blows from the east about 30% of the time in London. This was done to reduce noise over the most populated area neighboring Heathrow. This agreement is no longer in place, but it still affects how Heathrow operates. It now runs a policy of runway alternation. From 6 a.m. to 3 p.m., planes will land on the northern runway and take off from the southern runway. Then, the moment the clock strikes three, they switch, with planes taking off from the northern runway and landing on the south. This order also flips every second week. All of this is done to give the residents around Heathrow some relief from the constant blaring of jet engines over their homes. Not an ideal situation when you are trying to run a busy airport. Parallel runways like this are great for traffic, as two planes can land and take off simultaneously, once again maximizing traffic. 
You can see two planes landing at the same time at Heathrow, typically between 6 and 7 a.m. when departures are quiet, but you do need space between the runways. The FAA specifies that parallel runways with centerline space 760 to 1,300 meters apart must use staggered approaches, meaning planes cannot land side by side. Runways with centerline space between 1,300 and 2,700 meters can land simultaneously with air traffic control monitoring. Seeing a flight land alongside your own is a pretty common sight at LAX for this reason, with its runway pairs 1.4 kilometers apart. And even though Gatwick Airport has two runways, it operates as a single-use runway as they're too close to each other to work simultaneously. The alternative to parallel runways are intersecting runways, and while these are more space-efficient and can provide alternative approaches with a shift in wind patterns, they come with their own risks and require careful monitoring by air traffic control to prevent crashes. In general, a single runway operating both takeoffs and landings can achieve a similar throughput of aircraft if wind conditions are favorable. So when looking to increase air traffic volumes, placing additional parallel runways at least 1.3 kilometers apart is best. This is where Heathrow runs into its next design issue. Its location has made it near impossible to expand. Heathrow is now operating at 98% capacity and being UK's hub international airport, increasing capacity is a major concern. So where can we place another runway? Let's see. Uh, no, nope, definitely not. Uh, that won't work. Or will it? Amazingly, this was the proposal set forth earlier this year that will require a village to be bulldozed and a tunnel dug to reconnect the M25. This will cost $3.3 billion for the compulsory land purchases alone, with a further $18.4 billion for the expansion itself, though the British government has promised this bill will be entirely privately funded. Under its current format, Heathrow is constrained to about 480,000 flights a year but they have managed to continually grow passenger numbers by increasing the numbers of large long-haul flights passing through it, but this is not an option for all airports, as their runways are too short. Take Dublin Airport as an example. It currently operates two intersecting runways, one 2,623 meters long and another 2,072 meters long. To see why this is the problem, let's analyze runway length requirements. Basic runway length is determined by airplane performance, and to calculate it, we need to analyze the critical moments in an aeroplane's takeoff sequence. A plane hits six critical speeds during takeoff. The first is the stall speed. This is the minimum speed at which a plane will remain airborne. This is not used as the takeoff speed, as any decrease in speed due to fluctuations in wind or orientation of the plane will cause the plane to fall. The next critical speed is the minimum control speed. This applies to multi-engined aircraft only. If a multi-engined aircraft loses an engine, the uneven thrust between the wings will cause the plane to turn. This is called yaw in aviation. To counteract this, the rudder will be deflected to provide the opposite yawing moment. The rudder needs air passing over it to work, and thus the minimum control velocity is the velocity at which the rudder can provide enough of a yawing moment to keep the plane straight in the event of an engine failure. The next speed a pilot needs to worry about is V1. V1 is a line in the sand for pilots making decisions whether to abort a takeoff. If something happens before V1, like an engine failure, the pilot must abort the takeoff. If it happens above V1, they must continue with the takeoff, as it would be unsafe to stop. This is the most important speed for runway designers. At this speed, the plane will need enough distance on the runway to safely bring the plane to a stop, which is exactly the same as the distance needed to reach V1. The resulting total runway length is thus called the balanced field length. Back to that in a moment. The fourth critical speed is VR, or the rotation speed. This is the point the plane can begin to lift its nose and begin its ascent. The next speed, which results in some of the coolest testing videos, is the minimum unstick speed. This is the speed the plane can take off at its maximum pitch, which is actually the point where the tail skid hits the ground. This is a video of a test pilot testing that speed. Since this would be incredibly uncomfortable, the actual takeoff speed is at least 10% higher than the minimum unstick speed. At this point, no part of the plane is touching the ground and it is officially airborne. It must then accelerate to its climb speed, V2, which it must achieve with a minimum clearance of 10 meters from any obstacle. With all this in mind, we can begin designing our runway length. Planes are typically designed to use standard runway lengths and not the other way around, but these speeds can vary between aircraft, so let's start our calculation with the world's largest plane, the Airbus A380. Here we'll be assuming a maximum takeoff weight at sea level, with the International Standard Atmosphere model for weather conditions and no wind. 
A typical decision speed for a fully laden A380 is about 280 km per hour, or about 78 meters per second. This, along with the other critical speeds, do vary with flight conditions and will vary for the runway itself. The pilots have a flight computer to output the relevant critical speeds for this reason and gives them the appropriate thrust percentage to provide the acceleration needed. This is just an example. Assuming an average acceleration of about 2 meters per second squared, we can calculate the distance needed to reach V1 by employing one of the fundamental kinematics equation every high school student learned in physics, specifically this one. Initial velocity is zero, and we can rearrange the equation to find distance. Applying our variables, we get a distance of 1,521 meters to reach V1. In the event of an aborted takeoff, the plane will need an equal distance to bring the plane to a stop. This is called the balanced field length, which is simply double this distance at 3,042 meters. Again, this value varies widely, and V1 is dictated by the runway available, not just the plane performance. This graph provided by Airbus shows the various runway lengths needed for the A380 at various takeoff weights and altitudes, and agrees roughly with our calculation. So, as you can see, Dublin Airport's runways are too short to accommodate fully laden planes like this. Large, long-haul planes can and do land here when needed, but cannot take off with a full tank of fuel and passengers on board, which prevents any large long-haul carriers from operating from Dublin. Thus, a new runway is being built to run parallel to the existing longer runway to the south, but even this may be too short, as winds and weather will increase the runway distance needed. On top of this, Dublin Airport is 75 meters above sea level, which would add about 2% to the runway length requirements, as the thinner air reduces the lift provided by the wings, and thus increases the takeoff speeds. The longest runway in the world in Tibet at an elevation of 4,334 meters or 14,219 feet is 5.5 kilometers long for this reason. The temperature of the air at the airport also has a significant effect on the runway length requirements, with an additional 1% of runway length required for every 1 degree Celsius over the standard atmosphere measurement we used earlier at 15 degrees Celsius. Once again, this is a result of reduced air density reducing lift capabilities. Last year, this actually resulted in flights being delayed and cancelled out of Phoenix, Arizona when temperatures rocketed to 49 degrees Celsius. Clearly, designing airports is a tricky and expensive business. If money and space wasn't an issue, the ideal design would simply be multiple parallel runways spaced about 1.3 kilometers apart. The busiest airport in the world, the Atlanta International Airport, runs five parallel runways. Beijing comes next, running three parallel runways, each far enough apart to run simultaneous operations and long enough to accommodate any plane. Dubai Airport comes third with its two parallel runways, each over 4,000 meters long due to the heat of Dubai, allowing it to be one of the world's most important stopover points for long haul carriers. This pattern reoccurs all over the world. International airports with parallel runways long enough to accommodate large planes are consistently the busiest, but with limited space available, some alternative designs have been proposed to increase capacity, like this circular runway design, which would not only be a nightmare for air traffic control trying to direct airplanes and make it even more difficult for a pilot to land and take off, but would also only be useful in calm weather with no wind dictating takeoff direction. These are the kind of issues that are only found when engineers carefully analyze a problem. Without paying close attention to detail, it's easy to fall into the trap of thinking a design that looks promising on the surface will work. And if you want to improve your own analytic skills, a great place to start would be this course on logical thinking on Brilliant. Logic is the foundation of all problem solving skills. It's taking the information we have at hand and combining it to come to a new and unique conclusion. Training our logical thinking encourages people to think for themselves and question the information presented to us and to develop our own answers to problems. This course will help you develop your brain to better analyze the world through fun puzzles that gradually get more difficult and incorporate new ideas like set theory, formal logic, and machine logic. By the end of this course, you'll be able to solve problems involving AND, NOT, and XOR logic gates and use symbolic languages of logic to understand fun riddles. These may initially sound complicated and scary, but Brilliant guides you through problems that are broken into digestible sections that bring you from knowing nothing to having a deep understanding of the physics and maths that underlie everything in our lives. To support real engineering and learn more about Brilliant, go to brilliant.org forward slash real engineering and sign up for free. And the first 73 people that go to that link will get 20% off their annual premium subscription. 
As always, thanks for watching and thank you to all my Patreon supporters. If you'd like to see more from me, the links to my Instagram, Twitter, subreddit and Discord server is below.